Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to our press advisory. Uh, the purpose of today's effort is to communicate further to New Mexicans' recent decisions uh, about doing everything we can related to our public health emergency, keeping New Mexico families safe, making sure that we raise, continue to raise the level of awareness. Uh, in doing so, we really make a difference in protecting New Mexico families and to making sure that we're making every productive effort to manage this crisis in a productive, prepared, non-panicked environment. So we're going to continue to do that here. Um, and I want to discuss two critical pieces of information and updates. The first, and I'm going to call on the Department of Health and Dr. Smeltzer to give everyone an update on uh, the number of cases that are currently presumptive positive. Many of you are already aware that we're at 10, but I want to make sure that uh, Dr. Smeltzer talks to that specifically. After that, we're going to talk about why we're making the decisions related to the public health emergency that we are. Lastly, we're going to um, get an update about our decision last night to close all public schools for three weeks, K through 12. And after that update by our Secretary of Education, Secretary Stewart, we're available for the many questions I know that you have. We want to be in a position, and we'll continue to do that, to be available to every New Mexican so that we can clarify, continue to have open lines of communication, and to make sure that people feel like we are prepared to deal with any number of issues that will continue to present themselves. Um, so with that, I'm going to go immediately to Dr. Smelter to talk about the most recent cases uh, and to provide New Mexicans an update about that. Dr. Smelter. I can move out of your way. We're going to try to do this a little differently so that people can hear us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, I have some notes here, so I'll be looking down. I want to make sure that I get this correct. Indeed, it's true. We have 10 presumptive positive uh, patients with the uh, COVID-19 or novel coronavirus infection. Um, the new ones are a male in his 50s from Bernalillo County who is a close household contact of one of the other cases, one of the other previous cases. Um, we have a female in her 80s also from Bernalillo County who is a close household contact um, of that same case. Uh, that person is hospitalized. Um, the one that I mentioned first is isolated at home. Uh, the third new case is a female in her 70s um, from Bernalillo County, is also a close household contact uh, and is isolated at home. And the final is a female in her 20s from Santa Fe County uh, who has a travel history to New York and is isolated at home. So I want to talk a little bit about contact tracing. So we've clearly identified some household contacts that have become presumptive positive cases. So during our investigation, when we get a presumptive positive case, we do an extensive interview with the patient and the household members to determine all of their contacts um, over uh, their incubation period or over the time they've been in New Mexico if they've returned from travel. Uh, we uh, do a daily activity log. So we ask them on each one of the days from the 14 days prior to their onset of illness, what did they do? And we usually divide it up by a.m. and p.m. in order to identify exactly where they were and who they were interacting with. We then assign a team of investigators to track down all of those contacts. Now, if they list a place like a restaurant or a church, we work with the leaders or the owners of the restaurant, the management, or the leaders of the church to identify all of the people that were potentially in contact with them um, while they were symptomatic, and we track those folks down. We interview them and ask them about their symptoms. We get them testing if they 
have symptoms, and we ask them to self-quarantine at home if they don't have any symptoms. I think another big question that's been coming up is about our capacity for laboratory testing. We have not run into any um, situations where we didn't have the ability to do testing on patients that we really believe needed testing in this state at this time. Um, I will also like to add that right now there is a meeting going on between our state scientific laboratory division and Tricor reference laboratories. Tricor reference laboratory is the biggest reference laboratory in the state of New Mexico and it has begun testing patients um, for the novel coronavirus. So the state lab and the um, Tricor Reference Laboratory are meeting right now so that we can maximize our capacity to do testing for the residents of New Mexico. With that, I stand for questions. Right. Um, I'm going to ask everyone, and um, Dr. Scrace, I want to make sure that folks can see this chart and also hear you, because I think this is the evidence that I referred to in our first press conference to talk about the public health orders that I was issuing using all of the emergency declaration powers I have uh, as governor to protect New Mexicans and to really give a sense about why you work on containment strategies that protect New Mexicans and further spread. The more we do, to minimize spread, the better we stand up our healthcare system, the more lives we save, the more people we protect, the better we will, uh, the outcomes will be outside of this particular public health emergency. So what I might do is ask uh, my two secretaries to move that chart a little closer. Do you mind? I want to make sure that New Mexicans can really see this. And we'll have this available in other formats so that people can get online and take a look at it. But I think it's really valuable to see what it is we're striving for in our state. Dr. Scrace. Thank you very much, Governor. I do want to uh, talk about this uh, a little bit. If we could tilt it just a little bit more so I can see it too, that would be great. Uh, right to the mics. Okay, I can do that. So this uh, is a graph uh, that we've been looking at for several weeks in state government, and I'm going to describe it to you and then talk about some of the evidence behind it. It's based on a report from the CDC in 2017 that reflects back on the H1N1 pandemic, what we learned from that, and specifically evidence related to uh, the benefit of social isolation. So the graph shows the daily number of cases, the height of both of those curves, is the number of cases we're seeing per day. And you can see the large uh, mound there is cases where uh, no protective measures were taken whatsoever. And then the lower graph that has less area and much, much less height is the, our cases uh, where protective, significant societal protective measures and social, social isolation were implemented. A really important line on this graph is this dotted line that goes uh, horizontally, that shows the capacity of our healthcare system and the number of new cases we can take a day. And you can see that without any kind of protective measures, uh, the delivery system is immediately overwhelmed and with, uh, they're challenged, uh, but we're able to take care of everyone. The other thing you notice, and this is really, really important uh, because we're in this tail on the left right now of identified travel-related cases were not yet into the phase of community transmission, is without taking protect, protective measures, there's a very, very rapid growth in cases. And that is something that all of our uh, policy decisions are attempting to prevent. Uh, I do want to say a couple words about school closures. Uh, you can get this uh, uh, data from the CDC as well. But the, after the H1N1 epidemic, it was studied in Texas. School closures reduced uh, uh, the prevalence of the virus, the number of people who got it, from 45 to 72 percent. In Alberta, Canada, they saw a 50 percent drop in infection rates there. And in Mexico City, uh, they saw a 29 to 37 percent drop. Uh, the, the last thing I want to say, uh, and I don't want to preempt any further discussion on the schools, is that this only works if families take this seriously and adopt a principle of social isolation. 
if we, if we close schools and everyone goes to the park and kids are interacting with each other and, and continuing to play and touch each other, it, it, that's not social isolation. So we're really asking families of New Mexico to help us with this and to understand this concept of social isolation and why it will enable New Mexico hopefully to move from this very large uh, curve to the one you see uh, much smaller on the right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, as I get ready to call on Secretary Stewart, um, and uh, we got a, an effective presentation, thank you, by both Dr. Smeltzer and Dr. Scrace. And what I want New Mexicans to know is that your state government is using experts, physicians, and folks who understand how to respond in a public emergency. We also understand that these are very difficult decisions. The decisions to restrict gatherings is hard on businesses, hard on New Mexicans, it's hard on families. The businesses who try to figure out how to operate in a different context and individuals who'd already made plans to go to social gathering and, and events, this is hard to accomplish. We also know that it has a significant economic impact. And we are clear about that and we are hoping and I'm going to get some questions about what our plans are to address those very real concerns about making sure that we're not just addressing, which we will and are and will continue to do, this infection and public health emergency, but the impact of the public health emergency on the everyday lives of New Mexicans and workers and families and businesses. And so that's part of this press conference to make sure that people know that we are addressing that and we are confident that we have a number of tools in our toolbox to ease those burdens. I also want to thank two groups in particular in New Mexico and that's not to suggest to uh, viewers today, New Mexicans, that everyone uh, is uh, happy with any of these decisions. Anything that a government does that has the potential to affect your daily life rarely gets met with enthusiasm. I understand that. I do. And I want every New Mexican to know that and that we empathize with how difficult these decisions are on your day-to-day -day life issues. But I also want to thank them for calling with ideas, working to minimize spread, helping us navigate some of these issues, their patience as we stand up communication systems, as we gather information from both all of our state government partners, all of our emergency managers in local government, all of our sovereign nations. We have to connect that with the federal government information. Uh, and while I promised, and I will keep that commitment, that this doesn't help anyone to be engaged in a, I wish somebody would do this differently effort, no blame game. It has been quite challenging to work this outside of folks that we don't have direct responsibility for like the federal government. That makes it really challenging and we're going to continue to heighten our efforts to minimize those challenges. My goal is to not let those problems affect any single New Mexicans. That's my job, but it is, it is harder than it ought to be anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. My job is to mitigate. So we're going to keep doing that. Information will change. New Mexicans should expect that we will make decisions as quickly as we can, and it will feel difficult. Yesterday, schools were open. People are going to school today. Kids are going to school. Monday, they're closed. That's hard. But I will make the decisions that protect the entire state and then wrap around services and supports that make families and businesses as whole as we can. We will not be able to address every single issue, but every single New Mexican should feel like we are working to do that. And every single issue is important. Second group I want to thank. So families, businesses who have followed our advice, who are working hard to support their employees and their families, who are dealing with leave issues and dealing with salary issues uh, and having people telecommute and giving us ideas, thank you. Media, you have been incredible. We can't get this information out without you. You have been patient when we don't have a particular specific answer because it's information we just received at the same time that you did. 
I appreciate that. If we're going to make sure that New Mexico feels confident, and they should, that we'll make good, productive, evidence-based, that means using facts to make our decisions, you should have the confidence to know that we will do that. We are prepared to do that. And your efforts to help us get that information out and your patience about making sure we do it correctly has been incredible. And I will tell you that's not going on everywhere around the world. So while this is hard, and I am not trying to um, not recognize the hardships that are placed on businesses and families, thank you. Because without the full participation of the state, that's how you don't handle emergencies effectively. So we're doing a really effective job, and we have a long way to go, and we're all going to do this together. So to discuss the school closures, I'm going to go to Secretary Stewart, and then we're going to open it up, and we have a number of experts in the room who are going to address everything from making sure people are being paid, that we're standing up all of our systems, that we know that supplies are in short supply, that we have to feed New Mexicans, that child care is available and will stay available and stay open. And I'm sure there are a multitude of other questions. And we are prepared to answer as many questions as possible. And I'm going to put this information out before we go to Secretary Stewart, and then we're going to repeat it. We now have two communications systems that we want New Mexicans to engage in. First, I'm going to give the phone numbers. All right, we gave this phone number uh, in our first press conference Wednesday announcing these orders. Everything health related, let me repeat that, any information, questions about health, testing, must go to, please go to, 1-855-600-3400. Same number I gave before. 1-855-600-3453. That's all the health questions. You will be prompted when you make those calls, because then we get these calls going to public health experts, physicians, and we're working with private sector health care partners, and we are grateful for that. It's the only way this would work productively, and it is. And it is, as calls increase, our challenges increase, we identify those, and we get it fixed. So I want to thank every New Mexican for helping us improve our systems every single day. That's, that's what we want. The second, everything else number, my business, my school, my child care, food, supplies, anything else should go to this number, one 551 0518 1-833-551-0518. All right, now, because there are so many government agencies, all with unique responsibilities, from unemployment insurance and support and benefits, to Medicaid eligibility at the Human Services Department, and we're really focused right now on schools and family support services. To ask New Mexicans to navigate government systems on our best day is uh, difficult. Uh, and as a constituent of government services and someone who's worked in government, we want to make it easier, and we should. And they, you should expect that at, notwithstanding an emergency. But in this emergency, I want everyone to go to NewMexico.gov. We will be uploading and managing that system and improving our website so that you can get to any place you need to get to and navigate. I don't want people's benefits delayed. I don't want your questions delayed. I don't want your suggestions deferred. We want to make sure that we're getting really good information up. And there are many emergency managers, policy makers, and incredible advocates around the state. They want access and deserve it so that they can help us support their constituents in their communities. We'll repeat that information after we hear from Secretary Stewart and after we're engaged in answering questions. Thank you for letting me make sure that folks get that information early in this press conference. Secretary Stewart. 
Thank you, Governor, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, as all of you know, uh, we've made the very difficult decision to go ahead and close the schools for three weeks. Um, this is not a decision that we came to lightly. We brought all of our superintendents and all of our charter leaders together, uh, even yesterday, going through plans that we had been working on for weeks with DOH uh, and with other health experts around ways that we can uh, try to keep schools open because we know that schools provide essential services. Um, as we went through the day and continued to listen and get feedback from our, our leaders in, in both districts and charter schools, uh, we heard uh, a number of concerns and operational issues uh, from schools that we knew were, were likely to not have enough staff to make sure that they could effectively and safely run the schools, to parents um, calling in and saying that they were going to keep their kids home so that we'd have more kids falling behind as we continued in the educational process, and we also heard um, issues in around the schools about operationalizing uh, the plans for tracking and isolating students as this dynamic situation continues to progress and taking the measures to continue to minimize um, large groups of staff and students in, in, in their areas. So listening uh, closely to all of our partners who were on the ground and, and uh, doing the work, um, we did go ahead and make the very difficult decision to, to close the schools for the next three weeks. Um, we know that spring break for most schools uh, will occur within those three weeks. So uh, for many districts and charter schools, that's going to mean um, two weeks um, in addition to their spring break uh, in which they will be closed. Uh, and we think this is the best and most responsive and most responsible way that we can make sure we're taking care of our families, taking care of our students, and doing everything that we can in our power uh, in the, in the pre-K-12 public education system to combat the spread of the virus. Couple big notes um, as we go through this because we want to make sure that as we go through the closure, we're continuing to do everything in our, in our power to care for our families and care for our students. We are working with all districts and all charter schools to continue meal service. We've been working with the federal government around the waiver process for being able to extend our meal programs across the state. So we're going to be keeping cafeterias open and organizing um, grab-and-go meal programs and also working with other state agencies to work on distribution of meals to kids who aren't able to come in uh, to the school to be able to get their, their daily meals. We're also working uh, with our Department of Health partners to keep our school-based health centers open so that we're still able to provide those services to our, our students and families in need and any behavioral health and counseling services that can be done virtually or over the phone. We're working with all of our, our school partners to make sure that we're still able to keep those services going um, throughout the process of the closure. In addition, We've been, again, working and collaborating with all the superintendents and charter leaders across the state around what the implications are for this for the instructional program. We are going to be waiving the statutory requirements around instructional hours, and so schools and districts will not be making these days up at the end of the year. Um, this is important for a number of reasons, including making sure schools and districts who have access to extended learning programs at the end of the year continue to be able to do those, um, and also to make sure that we're able to um, address the labor and wage and funding issues that go along with the closure of this magnitude. So just as we're caring for, our, uh, caring for our families and caring for our students, making sure that our employees are safe and secure and that we are uh, keeping that economic stability in our communities during this time uh, is critically important, so keeping them paid and not having any gaps in their wages. So schools and districts will be paying their employees as if there was no closure. Uh, and as, as if school was still in session. We're going to be working with our labor partners and employees at our charter schools to uh, make sure that we are um, implementing that and also looking at ways that we can best deploy staff during these times um, to make sure that we're effectively utilizing uh, all available resources um, to, to be able to um, ser serve our students and keep some of these important programs going. Those districts that have online programs, we know we have many that have one-to-one -one devices and, and, and where they've invested in uh, technology to be able to offer services online. We encourage those districts to do so, to be able to provide those services on a, on a voluntary basis during the closure so that those students can continue to, to have access to the instructional program. Um, but again, we are waiving the requirement that these days uh, have to be made up at the end of the year. And we're also making sure that our hourly 
employees and our contract employees are going to get taken care of during this and make sure that they're not going to experience wage gaps as well. So again, schools and districts continue um, paying staff and, and operating as if there was no closure and school was still in session. We know that we've got a number of students um, who are coming up on state testing. We're going to be pushing back the assessment window so that we can address that and make sure that all of our students will, um, will that no one will, will miss out on the state testing uh, so long as, the, as the, um, the closure is in place. And all athletic events during the closure, practices and games are um, postponed or canceled. We'll be working with the NMAA to um, plan for the future of, of spring sports and make those adjustments to schedules and qualifications for the state tournaments. Um, uh, during, during this so we can communicate that out um, following the closure. So again, this was, um, this was not an easy decision. Uh, it was made uh, by listening very closely to our partners on the ground um, and by doing everything that we can to keep essential services operating for our kids and families um, while we go through this closure and making sure that we're taking care of our employees in the process. So thank you and I will give it back over to the governor. Thank you, Secretary. All right, should we maybe start before we do questions quickly? I promise I'll go fast. What are the best things that every New Mexican can do? Minimize contact. Wash your hands for 20 seconds. Um, be very careful and clear about the things that you can do independently to help us manage that. Do not panic. Be prepared. Work with us to make sure that we uh, do everything we can to minimize the negative impacts related to a public health emergency. All right, um, first question over here. I appreciate it. Uh, so I just want to make sure that we're giving New Mexico families really clear instructions, particularly when it comes to getting meals at school. So starting Monday, for breakfast and lunch, they can go to their students' school to get meals, and that'll start Monday? Yes. I just, so want, I just want to make sure we're giving the most clearest instructions to families. Yes. So. Um, the question is, on Monday, if you're in a community, can you go to your school and will that cafeteria be operating and can you get a meal? That is absolutely our intent and further guidance about do I drive up, do I get out of my car, will someone give it to me, will be uh, occurring today because we, have to, we do want to do the waivers and we do want to work with private <laughs> partners. If, for example, there is a school district or a school somewhere in New Mexico, and we're having issues with that. The Aging and Long-Term Services Department is ready to deliver meals. The National Guard, uh, and I've got General Nava here, they're prepared to deliver meals. So the way in which we provide the best preparedness is have redundant systems available. And I'm sure New Mexicans have seen that our healthcare partners like Presbyterian are identifying meal sites. The purpose of having NewMexico.gov and these phone numbers is to make sure is that that stuff filters very specifically today, that that information will be available. One more clarification that the number I gave you for all non-health issues, the 833-551-0518, just went live, you know, uh, putting the pieces. What I, here's what I mean by live New Mexico. I have the number. It's dedicated. We've assigned staff. We're providing education. We're loading up all of this information. We're connecting all of our partners. So you have to give us a little time today to do the rest. And you have to give us a little time to make sure that the information you just requested. But the intent is this. If you need a meal, and that's most of our New Mexico kids and families. So basically, we're treating this as a universal. You should expect that on Monday, for breakfast and lunch, you can get a meal at that school. If that turns into be a challenge for whatever reason, because information changes daily, and you could have a different set of circumstances in a community that I'm unaware of today. I'm not, I'm not aware of anything that gives me any cause for concern at this moment. But if I can't make that happen, meals will get delivered to you. Emergency responders in those communities will be prepared. No New Mexican should expect that we can't deliver them food during this crisis. As a quick call, you mentioned yep. the National Guard is mm -hmm. going to play a role. Can you explain what that role is? Yeah, absolutely. So in my first order, this is not new. So I don't want New Mexicans to think that, you know, we're, we're going into a different 
format. This is how we do and prepare for emergencies. So in my first order, the National Guard was identified and deployed as a full partner. The things, they're good at everything. And quite frankly, the New Mexico National Guard is best at everything. Here's why they're so critical. They are completely and fully equipped and trained for meal delivery, field health care services, and triage, transportation, uh, any number of activities. They are critical. They also have qualified, trained, licensed professional health care responders who they deploy with us depending upon what deployment makes the most sense based on the set of facts we have at any given time. But they're ready. Because if I don't have redundant systems, to your point, and something happens, maybe I have school workers that don't feel well. What have we told you if you're sick? Don't come to work. Right? Well, then I might have an issue with a particular kitchen or school. I have to be prepared that there are redundant systems available. And all of those are being stood up. And that's part of the decision. We make the decisions based on spread, then we have to have the ability to implement the strategies that protect New Mexico families. We're doing those simultaneously. Um, I'm gonna, I had one in the very back, and then I'm going to go uh, one more here, um, and then I'm going to come over here. Governor, you mentioned the uh, economic impact, the inevitable economic impact the pandemic is going to have on New Mexico. You mentioned you have plans. Can you elaborate on I, I can. So let's talk about the most effective tools that we have at our disposal immediately. Unemployment insurance is an incredible tool, and the intention, actually, is to meet the basic needs of an individual who doesn't have right income security because they've been laid off and there's a shift in work circumstances. So we are working with the federal government to waive all of the kinds of things that make it really challenging, particularly no fault of any New Mexicans, that we are in a public health emergency. So we waive the rules about looking for jobs. We waive the rules, you know, about how difficult it can be, because we have to look out for fraud under normal circumstances. We would still do that in an emergency, but we don't expect that that's what New Mexicans are, are doing. We know that New Mexicans are trying to feed their families, pay their mortgages, right? We're clear about that. So that's the broadest tool that we have. Uh, these numbers get you to getting folks online, so you're not coming into our offices, to use those tools immediately. Absolutely. And the Secretary would like to add, but I'm, as you come up here, we are also meeting with all the Chambers of Commerces. We are talking about as the economic relief packages get clearer by the federal government, my understanding today is that uh, the President is going to issue their emergency uh, declaration. You do those early so that you don't have to be answering questions about what could happen. You're already implementing them by now, but we're expecting that there will be economic relief packages that we can make to businesses. And I don't have the specifics about what that looks like, but we do not want to further distress already distressed small businesses, distressed large sectors like the energy sector, and we're going to have to think about strategies that provide an infusion to stand up those businesses. So my expectation is to work with the federal government to do that in large part, but we are working with businesses on strategies right now to address that because we understand this has a severe economic impact. Secretary. Thank you. Good morning. Bill McCamley. I'm the Secretary of the Workforce Solutions Department. We oversee the unemployment services for the state. Starting at 8 a.m. on Monday morning, we are waiving work search requirements for unemployment for anyone who is affected by the COVID-19 situation. That can, examples such as um, if I'm asked to be in quarantine and I can't go to work, we will include that. If my hours are cut at whatever job I'm doing or those hours go away, we will include that. We are gonna be as flexible and open as we possibly can. As the governor pointed out, we are asking people who want to file a claim to go online. And our website will be available on the centralizednewmexico.gov website that was coming up is in process, that will be available. There are a couple caveats to this. First, we ask that people uh, have to certify once a week. That doesn't mean they have to do a job search if they want to go back to their other job when it comes back, but they have to certify. Second, the maximum amount of unemployment is $461 a week. 
If you are a business and you want to try to cut hours for people instead of laying them off, an employee can go and file for unemployment and make up the difference between whatever they make for the week and that $461 level. So if I'm making $600 a week, I get my hours cut in half, I can make $161 from unemployment in addition to the $300 that I make with my reduced hours. That's called layoff aversion. It is a strategy we are frequently, we use uh, on a much more case-by-case uh, -case basis, but in this case, we, we imagine we'll be using it quite a bit. The last thing that we want to say is that uh, we are working to really monitor, as the governor pointed out, what's going on at the federal level. Uh, I know that there is a bill going through Congress right now that is uh, considering things like unemployment, possible sick leave. We are in constant contact with both our national association, our federal delegation, and the governor's staff in D.C. to figure out what that is, and we'll be working to implement those things as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. All right. Let's see, I was going to go there. Yeah, I okay. was going back to uh, the meals. We just received a question from an employee at um, a Santa Fe school. Who's going to be serving these meals? They're, they're scared. They don't want to go to work. Um, the regular employees that work at schools. So, again, I appreciate that we've got um, workers who are, who are worried. But being worried doesn't help us address these issues. So essential staff and workers, we need you to keep coming to work, and they're the experts. They know how to prepare these meals. They know how to make sure these meals are safe. You know, we have a system for feeding kids that's really productive. Uh, this is a time where we thank all those incredible workers, right? And sometimes they're the unsung heroes, cafeteria workers, the nutritionists, the cooks, the custodians. We are expecting them, unless they're sick, to come to work. They will be paid, people who are not essential to the delivery of meals and school-based health centers, right, are on call. This is how we protect everyone further. We do not have, to date, the kind of widespread community infection issues that would drive us to close buildings. I don't expect that to occur. Why don't I expect that to occur? Because we're doing these containment measures, the whole purpose to be ahead. So I don't want New Mexicans to be afraid. What I want New Mexicans to do is to be prepared. So we're going to have those workers at these schools. If we have an issue with the school and there's something that shifts, we will have other vehicles to make sure these families get fed. And so the best information is make sure I know where this question comes from, and we will do extra effort in that community to make sure that there's real clarity about where meals are going to come from. But remember my redundant services. If I have an issue at a school, the National Guard will know where you are. We will bring you meals. Aging and long-term services, which has incredible expertise at delivering meals, right? They do it for thousands of senior citizens every day in the state of New Mexico. They're ready to go. So I have great confidence in meeting the nutrition and food issues for every single New Mexico family. But our workers need to come to work. And one, one last thing yeah. uh, for our Spanish-speaking audience. Um, will there be somebody in, in Spanish to answer at least this, these numbers? Absolutely. And we've got folks here um, uh, who are ready to talk to the media. Uh, in Spanish, we need to make sure that there's no language barriers to getting information out to Mexicans. That's one of the reasons that these numbers are so important. I want to repeat what I said earlier. The health care number works perfectly. Had some, right? All, there's always, when you have a surge, that meeting that capacity is challenging. We've met those challenges. It should get smoother and smoother and easier and easier. That's what my job is, to make sure that that happens. The second everything else line, I want New Mexicans to have that number. People are coming online. They're getting trained. We're dealing with these language issues. If you call it right this minute, you will be dissatisfied with your response. Give us a couple of hours or more to make sure that we have that in the context. But I want people to have this number. 
Because when we made this decision last night, we were beginning to work, right, with telecommunications partners, identifying locations, checking those numbers, identifying staff who can answer these questions, giving them information about what our state strategy is. So we're doing that work. So today, several hours from right this minute, that family can get that question directly answered. But you should expect that I'm going to use you to make sure that we're broadcasting information and Facebook living information so that New Mexicans know that as these issues come up, they have access to information that solves their problem. And I appreciate that that person reached out. I'm going to go to this side, then I'm going to come back. Um, earlier you mentioned plans for child care. What are those plans? Can you elaborate? I can, and then I'm going to ask uh, Secretary Gurginsky, who's in charge of our child care system uh, in large part, and she does that today in partnership with children, youth, and families. And this may be uh, too much information for New Mexicans, but we're building, right, early childhood education and more child care slots in our state. Uh, we're very proud of that work. Uh, makes me feel even more confident that these are decisions that are really meaningful in emergencies and in non-emergencies alike. And she's going to talk about those specifics, but I want you to have some general information. Child care will continue. Child care is required federally to stand up in every emergency, and you can, all of us can understand why. Without child care assistance, you're not supporting families, you're not keeping kids safe. Uh, we can't do that, and we wouldn't do it. Uh, a shout out to every child care worker, right? Because without this workforce, we can't make this a reality. We also, there's child care before and after school at schools. So now that schools, so remember it's the educational component that has been delayed, right? Three weeks, we're not going to school starting Monday through April 6th. But we can have the buildings open for food. We have the buildings open for child care assistance. So we have a plan for extending licensure, making sure that we've got staff who are available to provide child care services. And I'm going to make sure that I give enough time for the, the folks who are I hold accountable and responsible. I trust them to meet the needs of our families to give you some further details. But that's the basic concept. We'll have to grow it. Buildings have to be open. We have to make sure that people can get paid. We have to do all of the things that, that give New Mexicans confidence. That the child care you use today stays. That if we need expanded child care, we're going to make sure it happens in public school systems. And the same rules apply. If someone is sick who works in a child care, they don't go to work. Right? They must do social isolation at home. It doesn't have to be this virus. Cold, flu, you don't go anyway, right? And then we work on ramping up a workforce if we need to do that in the context of this particular effort to contain the spread of this virus. Secretary, I'll go this way. Thank you, Governor. Um, I think she um, covered uh, very many of the important points. I just want to give a, a shout out to our providers in the community who have been doing an incredible job keeping us informed of what their concerns are and their needs are. We have a call with all of them this afternoon to talk through some of the challenges. We have an incredible team at Children, Youth, and Families, Early Childhood Services, and a number of contractors across the state who are all on high alert. They're reaching out. They're supporting our providers with issues around supply. We're hearing from some of our first responders. People need help, and we are responding um, with that. And we are putting together a frequently asked question list. We'll be sending that out later today, both in English and Spanish, and really making sure that our parents, our families, and our providers have access to us as state employees and to all of our contractors uh, so they can get their questions answered. And as the governor said, things are changing. Uh, so we will be doing this daily with making sure our providers uh, have access to us. And through that phone number that the governor gave, they'll be able to route to our child care resource and referral agency and get help and support with finding child care. Uh, so let's say I'm a single parent and I have a third grader. Monday, what do I do if I have to go to work? Can I bring my child to school at that point? Will schools be open with some sort of care center? What happens Monday? Yeah. Um, I would encourage them to call the phone number, call our child care resource and referral agency. There could be a, um, a 
after school program in the community that they could access. This is the conversation we're having with our providers this afternoon. We are submitting a temporary waiver to the federal government uh, to do some of the things the governor mentioned in terms of um, expanding licensing, allowing people to expand their care, uh, looking at alternative um, ways to credential staff. We Protecting the health and safety of our families and our community is the most important. So we're going to do this in partnership with our providers and with families and with children, youth, and families and the public education department. And I, I wanted to speak to that just for a minute. These are exactly the kinds of issues that really make it challenging for that single parent. And we need families to step up where they can. Not every family can. We need safe, known, productive neighbors that you use already for supporting each other. I need you to help do that. I need that employer to allow our single mom to telecommute from home as we figure out this effort. I mean, it's a real call. We're in this together. And we are clear that if we don't have those supports in our state, it will make the jobs, and it is our jobs, to mitigate and problem solve for every single problem, and there will be many, our job is to be available 24-7 to navigate that and address it. And my staff are clear that that is my expectation. That should be the expectation of every New Mexican. But there is no question that we only achieve the kind of results that I'm expecting for our state if everybody works together. And I'm going to give you a, a personal example, which doesn't help the example of a, of a family that's got limited family support, maybe new to New Mexico, in a brand new job, not sure about these policies without leaving. These are examples that are real in the state, and we're going to have to address those. My daughter's going to telecommute. She's got two kids. She's going to take on all the kids for an extended family. She can do that. We're going to need, everyone's going to need to do as much as they can to help us mitigate these challenges. And so I have no trouble asking New Mexicans to help. Uh, New Mexicans should expect government leaders, including myself, to be unabashed about the fact that we have to do it together. So that's a very important question, and I thank you for raising it. I'm going to go right back here. I'm going to come back around. It's going to take us a while to get to all the questions. Go ahead. Um, I have a question. I don't know if this is based on what Dr. Schmelzer said. Um, so I'm curious about the severity of the cases. Uh, you mentioned that one is now hospitalized. I'm curious is that person um, in intensive care? And if you can speak to the other nine, are they uh, mild cases? Can you say anything about that severity? And then tied to that, um, the fact that three of them were uh, contracted at, because of close contact with in the previous case, does that now raise concerns about community spread? So, uh, so I'm going to go to the last part first. I'm going to call up the, uh, our physician and epidemiologist who's an expert. I want to reassure New Mexicans that I'm making decisions based on the collective wisdom and knowledge of some really impressive, smart New Mexicans who care about New Mexico. So I'm grateful to have that. We are all, any new case is a case we're concerned about. If you aren't concerned about how these are being contracted, what you know about them, you aren't trying to get to this issue. Containment, minimizing impact is my job. So we're concerned about all of them. We are, and I'm going to get clarification, but the way in which I'm asking them to communicate with me so that I can communicate with the public is that when I have a known way that that infection spread, you travel to a place of high risk out of the country. You've been traveling where you came into contact with other travelers that may have been at those high risk places. So now I've got a connection. And that is, for me, not now community spread or contamination. Right? That's what happens with a highly infectious, highly contagious virus, which is why this is so important for us to get as, as, as effectively as we can ahead of it and know what's coming. We will get more cases. New Mexico will see more cases. Quite frankly, as I'm expecting them to come up with science-based measures to increase and expand what I call testing and surveillance, 
we're going to see more cases because there's been a lot of people traveling and exposed to family members. I have faith that they're getting it done exactly the way that they should, but the way we're describing it right now is that these are sort of known expected outcomes by virtue of travelers who were exposed to travelers or individuals that we knew were exposed to this infectious disease. Lastly, and I want to make sure that you correct me, and he will, um, if I did anything wrong, um, all of the cases as of yesterday, so you have to update me too, everyone was in good and stable condition, and uh, that can change. I, I, I am gratified. We don't have any more serious issues today. I want New Mexicans to be safe. I care about each and every one of you. And so we're going to get an update about the hospitalization. So, Doctor. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the first thing I'd like to say is about the patients who are not hospitalized. Those that are home doing their self-isolation self at home, uh, they're stable. They're uh, either asymptomatic, they're not having any symptoms, but they're home for uh, after they've recovered and we want to make sure that they're not continuing to shred, to shed the virus. Um, or they're still actively symptomatic, but they're not requiring a hospitalization. The two patients that are hospitalized as of yesterday were, stabilized, were stable in the hospital. I don't have a complete update from this morning, but we have active investigators working with our hospitals to make sure those patients are doing well. Um, the governor was correct about community spread. Uh, we use that term when there are cases that we cannot explain their exposure. So in all of our cases, all of our presumptive positive cases in the state of New Mexico, they all have an explanation currently of travel. So they're travel-related cases. Um, when we have cases that we aren't able to explain their exposure, that's when we will start talking about community spread. Um, we are likely to use a few terms. Number one, community spread that I just mentioned. Number two, limited community spread, which would mean in a certain geographic area, not that many cases. We don't use absolute numbers because it depends a little bit on the characteristics of those cases and the communities we're talking about. And then we would say larger scale uh, community uh, spread. So anytime we change what type of cases we have in this state, we will be transparent, communicate that um, to the press as well as to the communities that are involved um, and be working to take the next steps to try to minimize the impact of this uh, infectious disease. Just to follow Thank up you. on that, so there are two out of the ten are hospitalized? That's correct. I said one, so I've been corrected. Okay. It's two. And are they in intensive care? Or is it severe? Or, or, uh, but you said they're both stable. They're both stable. Um, one of them is in the intensive care unit. And I, I say that they were stable yesterday. I don't have an update for this morning. Can, can you say which one is uh, hospitalized besides the 80-year-old woman? Uh, I want to check my notes so I make sure I get this correct. Okay. The other hospitalized patient is a, the 60s, uh, a woman in her 60s from Santa Fe County. And to your knowledge, have any of those patients had contact with the school or someone who works in the school? So there have been some contacts with school. I don't have all the details. Um, I should tell you, I mentioned we do this extensive contact tracing. I have wonderful staff who are very thorough doing that, but I don't have all of those details. There have been some schools that have contacts. We are working directly both with the school, the families, and the communities around there um, to make sure they're safe and that we're taking all possible um, precautions to prevent further spread. I'm going to go to this side. I know that's hard, and I'm going to uh, get back, but stay close. Certainly. All right. So I'm going to go. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to do three on this side. Chris, you might be stuck with having to wait just a little bit. So I'm going to go to the back. Then I'm going to go in the middle. Then I'm going to go here. 
Then I'm going to come back over here. Gentlemen in the middle, you'll be the first on this side. We'll do three. So I'm going to go three to three. And I apologize. I don't keep the order as effectively as maybe I will get used to in the coming weeks. But I will do my best to improve. Yes, ma'am. Um, this was touched on a little bit, but can you speak to the concern, if any, uh, about teens who may not be going to school but then are out at the malls or the movies or things like that? Yes. So we had, and this is not your question, but I'm just going to launch into it. There have been some folks who have communicated with our experts uh, about having kids at home is a whole other uh, series of uh, non-productive issues. And these kids are going to get into trouble, and it's going to be awful. We know kids go home in the summer. Kids are off on spring break. We don't see an increase in negative activity as a result. We're not expecting any change. The same information that we've been providing. I need these teens not to be in areas where they're coming into contact. So the closing of the schools is not intended to say to them, like we are someone who's sick, you have total social isolation. But we want folks to mitigate. And you heard Dr. Scrace from the Human Services Department say that if we close schools, but we've got adolescents gathering in a park, we're going to malls or movies, then we're not doing as good a job as I would like the state to do to mitigate. So here's where that texting and Facebooking become activities that increase our public health safety and management tools. I will tell you that, and the docs will have to uh, correct me, that sunlight is actually ultraviolet light effective in killing many viruses. We think an impact here too. Wouldn't hurt to go to your backyard. Don't get sunburned. Today, I guess no one can get sunburned with this rain. I welcome the moisture. But, and we'll put these practical tips up on, on our websites because they're important and they're useful. So I really am asking parents and our emancipated young people to really think about how they can help us manage exposure. So we really don't want that. And it has an impact on local business. It does. And so I know local businesses, and they're doing everything they can to support us. We know it's hard for them, too, when we're asking New Mexicans not to go to movies. OK. Um, right here. I'll go. Dan, you're going to have to wait till the next round. Do you mind? All right. Sorry about that. Oh, well, I was going to ask about the, uh, which schools uh, have been affected, and then um, uh, if and when there's community spread, um, uh, when would you think about going to a quarantine? And the third part is, you know, there's a line in here uh, on this graph about um, system capacity. Mm -hmm. People are starting to ask about, or we've been asking about ICU and um, ventilator capacity. That might motivate people with their behavior. I, I hope so. Look, if we overwhelm even the best healthcare system, even if you were without this emergency, maybe beyond what is recommended for emergency healthcare capacity, we're not, most states aren't, but let's in this hypothetical say that a state was. If we have the kind of outbreak that can happen with a virus like this, you're going to overwhelm your healthcare system. This is why this is so important. So to your point, we're really talking about social isolation and expanding what that would look like in community spread for maybe whole neighborhoods, communities, cities, counties. We're not there yet. New Mexicans should expect that I'm prepared to make every hard decision that saves lives. That's my barometer here. So if, if we have issues, and we're going to have more cases, I want to be very clear about that. There will be more cases. I said that when we announced our public health emergency order. There will be more cases. And as a result, my job is to stay ahead of these curves. So each decision that we make is intended to be proactive. Don't wait as long as other communities and countries before you make these decisions. So I can't tell you if that's going to happen. I can't tell you when that's going to happen. You have to make the decisions in advance of what you think is coming 
and use the science about what you know about that. I'm going to have the doctor talk about the school. I also want folks to be really clear that, and, they, and they've been great. We don't want the kind of reaction, I'm going to need help from the press and from our viewers. When people know a location, you know, we are very, very protective of personal patient identification and hospital information. That, that is inappropriate for us and illegal, quite frankly. So we aren't going to do that. We don't want New Mexicans coming to inappropriate conclusions or being so afraid they exhibit negative, hateful behavior towards a school or a neighborhood or a community or an educator or a student. That is unacceptable. No one did this on purpose to anyone else. This is, we know about pandemics. They are not new. It's how we respond to those. So I just really, it's very important to say that. I, I saw a little escalation of that the last couple of days. For the most part, I'm really proud of the state, uh, and thank you. That makes my job so much easier. I need us to continue along that path. If you want to speak to the school doctor or Dr. Scrace, I'd be happy to have you fill in the gaps. Certainly. Thank you, Governor. Um, as the Governor just said, um, we tend not to name schools and other institutions that might um, allow for the identification of the patients and their families. Um, we consider their privacy to be incredibly important both to them as well as to our investigations so that we don't have um, unwanted interruptions in that investigation and we can effectively try to prevent spread in our communities. And uh, if I might, how many questions do you guys does the state have? What's the capacity? So we, I don't know the exact number of beds uh, the, for, for ICU beds. I do know that the Department of Health knows that and tracks that every day. It's in a different part of our department. Um, and they track that information regularly and we work directly with the hospitals um, to assure that those beds are available um, to the patients that need them. And ventilators, you can't release that information? I don't have that number. Um, there, we do as well tra um, track that information through our Bureau of Health Emergency Management, our emergency preparedness group, in order to know our capacity. And we also have the ability to augment that with requests to the um, Strategic National Stockpile, a federal asset to, to get more of those delivered. Um, and I might mention, um, I'm, I'm, we apologize for the movement, but we are already making requests to the National Stockpile. We don't wait, so we make sure that protective gear is available. We make sure that we're talking about if we need ventilators and how many, what's the prudent number to have available. You can, I'm going to use this language, license or certify a bed or a room to take care of more acute patients. And I do not recall which station, and I do not recall the source from last night, that there was a source that put out, I think it's a credible source is why I'm using it, that there are 3,000 um, what I'm going to call acute beds available in New Mexico in the immediate to take care of New Mexico patients with the equipment that they would need to do those patients. I want to also really focus on what Dr. Smeltzer said, that our job remembers to not go to the pink, stay to the brown. Is that brown or purple? But the, the, we want this lower curve, and we'll put out as much of that fact-based information. But it shifts as the, as the issues that we need to address change. What we do about making sure that there's hospital care available, that shifts. Um, but that number was released last night. It may have been the hospital association. Quite frankly, it could have come from the appropriate bureaus at the Department of Health. Our job's to be transparent. There's no one in government who's not trying to provide accurate information. That's our job. So good for the folks who put that out. And uh, we'll get that updated as we can. Dr. Scrace. Uh, we had that question at the previous press conference. You may have asked it and checked. Information from the DOH two days ago is that we have 344 ICU beds in New Mexico. Two days ago, 54 of those beds were open. Okay, right here. Uh, if the school closure uh, forces some health care providers to stay home and take care of their kids or something, does that at all affect the health care <coughs> system capacity 
to, to serve people? Is that something we've looked at or are anticipating? So it's possible, right? So what we need is our direct care providers uh, to be like the essential individuals that we talk about. So we do that with the Department of Health has powers to make sure that we keep our healthcare professionals moving. You might remember that I, in my emergency order, I di uh, directed the Department of Insurance and they have already put out emergency rules. I think they might be the most aggressive emergency rules about costs and carriers in the country and they should be. I don't want anyone to have any any out-of-pocket costs related to this particular virus and public health emergency. They also have powers to make sure that we have the right health care professionals and in that order specifically I talked about making sure that we're credentialing. So there are other providers that we may have access to including today Canadian nurses We'll make sure that they're available to us that there's no barrier in our system for quality have the right education and experience, we're not going to minimize that, that we have access to those folks. So we're clear about that. We're getting good responses. Our partners are not indicating that we have an issue uh, currently, but if the school closures create any F, uh, issue related to that, the Department of Health will make those um, shifts to make sure that we can respond. Yep, and Dr. Scrace. Thank you, Governor. Uh, we have been in conversation with major health care systems today about this issue and the effect that uh, uh, closing schools might have. So two things I just want to mention about that. Number one is that in my conversations with healthcare leaders, they completely acknowledge that they'd much rather have a, a slightly lower level of staff and stay on the curve to the right than to have uh, everybody working and have to deal uh, there. So the potential for being completely overwhelmed uh, by the curve on the left uh, outweighs that concern. And also uh, some additional information uh, that you might find useful, again, from a study done at Harvard after the H1N1. It was on 523 patients from 39 states. 90% uh, of parents agreed with the closure of the schools. 85% believed the dis dismissal reduced disease transmission. 75% of the parents said a dismissal was not a problem, and about 20% of parents reported that an adult in the household missed work because of the dismissal. So I'll have this available afterwards, but I think that's uh, evidence-based data that parents actually are more concerned about protecting their kids than they are about uh, inconvenience. In the middle here. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Ryan, I'm interested in your uh, preparations for distance learning, not only over these next three weeks, but if instruction has to continue remotely after that. Um, as you know, technology infrastructure can really vary district to district. Santa Fe Public Schools has a laptop and a tablet for every kid. A school district like Santa Rosa doesn't have laptops for every high school kid. So. When it comes to supplying districts with technology, setting up Wi-Fi hotspot, hotspots, or whatever it might be, what sort of emergency actions is your department prepared to take to uh, ensure that, that distance learning can be equitable? Thank you. Great question. And uh, we, we've talked with all of our um, uh, superintendents and charter leaders about this. It is a major concern um, because we know that there are uh, vast inequities around who does have access to both the hardware, the broadband access, and the software, and who doesn't. And what we don't want to do in making in, in any of these decisions is um, exacerbate opportunity gaps that exist between uh, those who have those uh, devices and access and those who don't. So we're actually working right now to uh, gather all of that information from our districts in terms of what they have, because as you know, um, purchasing those materials and, and uh, training teachers on those uh, varies as a local decision uh, from district to district and school to school. So uh, we've been gathering that information. We've also been working to uh, work with all of our vendors to um, catalog, categorize, and then begin uh, pulling support documents together for all of those who are um, uh, able and uh, ready to deploy online systems so that they're able to do so. We do not recommend 
um, that those districts where there are inequities and those schools where there are inequities um, move forward with online learning if it's going to leave people out of the educational process. But we do know that there are many districts across the state who this is, uh, and many schools across the state, where this is part and parcel of what they do, and their, their schools, their students, their families are set up to, to access those. And so we want to encourage those um, those uh, who have done that to be able to offer um, those services to families and students um, while we are um, going through this closure. Mm -hmm. yeah, sort of going off that, Governor, I just you've mentioned a lot of, of reading online and looking up this information, but for so many in the state, internet is, is not really accessible, it's not a reality. So how are you looking to either expand internet service or get this information out through the mail or other ways to people? So every day we adopt new planning strategies to meet the needs of New Mexicans. We meet at least three times a day at the highest level uh, in, uh, in uh, the cabinet room upstairs. We uh, will take a look at that issue. We uh, directed our uh, Department of Information Technology to begin to look at these issues. At the beginning of this press conference, I was, um, I hope, clear, because that's a painful thing to be clear about. As challenges and opportunities present themselves, we're not going to be able to meet to the satisfaction of me, because I want it to be perfect, of every single issue or family in the state. The goal is to get as close as we can. We think we have private sector partners who can help us provide opportunity and safety for families who find themselves in a situation where they're not available to support their kids and to get information. It is really why we have these telephone numbers. People need to know that they can call someone, that a person, you'll be cued, right, so that we're not overwhelmed. That's why there has to be a person on the other end of the line, so that you know that someone knows where you are and that we can do something. It's really how we do some of the best communications in emergency preparedness and emergency responding. And I had lots of folks say, in this day and age, you don't need telephone numbers. You absolutely need telephone numbers, and that's exactly why we have them. And uh, uh, you may be very impatient with me, and you're wonderful. I'm actually going to ask, uh, answer a little bit more a question you asked about single mom um, with a child at home. I promised Chris I would go there, and I actually gave out two different sets of information about how I was going to handle each side, so you have to forgive me. So we've, we're getting folks like the Albuquerque Police Department, right, who are offering to have police officers as appropriate, engage in child care activities and support. That's a, and this is why I want to mention it. I didn't mention it as part of our protocol because we have to test these ideas. They have to, they have to work. I have a public safety issue I got to address. I have to make sure that this would work for some parents and it's comfortable and it's safe and it's productive. This is why I defer to the experts, but just to give you a sense that we are really talking with partners and we're getting great support for people who are really thinking through what roles could they undertake that would make the difference. And I just wanted to give folks uh, in that context a shout out. I don't want any New Mexican to assume that we're deploying our first responders in this way, but I want you to thank them for offering up solutions and suggestions and mechanisms so that we are utilizing every resource, and that's the point of many of the questions that would be at our disposal. I'm going to come right back to you. Chris, I'm going to keep my promise because she's so nice. Thank you. Uh, in the time that we've been in the room, Secretary Keyes sent out a press release explaining some different economic development options for businesses affected by COVID-19. Can you briefly explain how the COVID-19 business loan guarantee program will work and who qualifies for that? So um, I may not be able to give you the specifics in this minute, but I'll give you an example about some of the things we've been discussing with the Economic Development Department, including utilizing the local economic development funds as loan guarantees to make sure that we don't have businesses that under this, circum under this emergency can't keep their doors open. So I've, I have requested that the Economic Development Department use every tool in their toolbox to address this. And if there's someone who's with me today who can speak to those very new specifics, I'll have them do that now. And if they can't, we'll get that information to you. But it is an example that that broad order, every department must address to the highest degree possible these issues that will 
present themselves and must be uh, dealt with in short order. We do have small business re um, uh, revolving loan funds. We are working, and you heard the Secretary of Workforce Solu Solutions talk about the Small Business Administration and our efforts with the federal government. Every opportunity is on the table. Our job is to keep our businesses' doors open. Our job is to make sure that small businesses, which don't have some of the kind of fluidity and luxury to, to deal with these issues in the same way that a large company has, but this affects every New Mexican, every New Mexico business, large and small. But thank you for the question. I'm going to go back here again, because I promised. Okay. For the two people who are in the hospital, are they working one-on-one -on -one with nurses right now? Do they have a personal nurse? And for the people who are working with them in the hospital, are they undergoing some sort of self-quarantine in the hospital? Or are they able to go home? What's the process there? It's going to depend, and I'm going to have the docs with the expertise come up here. But when, when we're dealing with an infectious disease, this is not just like getting other hospital or acute care services. Because if you treat it as such, then you are not dealing with the fact that you have a virus that's highly contagious. We have other highly contagious issues. We do. Flu would be another example of that. All right, so hospitals are required to have A, infection control measures, B, infectious disease containment measures, and patients who are being treated for COVID-19 must have those protective measures in place for both the healthcare workers and the patient. Our job is to treat them, give them the best health care and medical treatment available, and to make sure that we do not continue the spread. So they go into a, med I'm calling it a medical isolation. Let's get a doctor to explain to New Mexicans exactly what that looks like. Dr. Scrace. I, I actually was going to say that I don't have anything to add uh, to what the <laughs> governor said. She did a really good job of describing it in layman's terms. And we, ha I mean, hospitals have very rigid uh, policies about personal protection for healthcare workers, patients, isolation, ventilation of the rooms, and they're simply following the protocols that they use for every other infectious disease. So is it I'm a one-to-one -one situation, like one nurse per, or is it a whole group with that one person? I think it, right it depends. Yeah. It, it, it depends. Each hospital is required, without an emergency, Every healthcare provider to be licensed is required to meet a certain standard to be able to respond to these circumstances. That is part of what their license requires. The issues related to that patient are going to determine exactly what level of that protocol they undertake. But we have confidence that they know exactly what they're doing. And actually, I don't know if you all, and many of you are here, remember, New Mexico's protocols were identified as some of the best practice protocols for, as we were in, uh, helping other communities and countries with SARS, as we had to deal with HANA virus, as we dealt with H1N1. So we, I would, I would like every other leader and every, every American, I don't want any of these issues that anyone has to deal with. There are many infectious diseases that the Department of Health deals with on a regular and routine basis. That's good public health. But they know what they're doing, and we're going to make sure that they do that. Go ahead, and then I'm going to go to Dan in the back, and then back over here, because I keep forgetting, and then to you. And you might have to help me then. You might have to just remind me. I'm not trying to ignore anyone. Every question's valid and makes a difference for the people who are trying to get prepared. Uh, I just want to make one, one last comment that might get to the question that underlies your question, and that is that, <clears throat> of course, in healthcare, we don't have a single person, a single doctor, nurse, a respiratory therapist for infectious patients. But they're very strict guidelines. So if I go into a room with a patient with one sort of infection, you know, I have to don uh, gloves, mask, sometimes a hat, gown, uh, treat that patient. Uh, I forgot to mention washing my hands first. Come out of the room, take off all of that equipment, wash my hands, Go into the next room if that patient's in isolation. Same exact routine, and so that, and it's very rigid, and, and particularly in ICUs, very strictly enforced. So, I, I think you might be getting at: Do we have people uh, carrying infections from one person to another? And I think that is to prevent that eventuality is exactly why the protocols are in place. All right, Mr. McKay, let's go there. Uh, can you address how long we can expect this to? to go on? Is this a new normal for the rest of the year? Is it something that 
will ease up when the weather is warmer? What should we be preparing for? So I would love to be able to give you a specific day when all of the issues that are not normal return. That's an impossible thing for me to do, and I won't predict for New Mexicans because it's unfair. Uh, and for folks who do that, it's completely inappropriate that warm weather is going to make a difference, uh, that as the other countries figure it out, that's going to make a difference. Here's our job, and we'll make every single decision that limits the amount of time that we can expect these drastic measures to be in place, but we're unafraid to make decisions that protect us, and so we're doing them in the time frames that we think get us to this containment issue. So three weeks with schools, this containment issue. Gatherings of no, uh, no more than, uh, or less than 100, get us to this containment issue. Asking businesses to adopt uh, uh, telework policies, help us get to this issue. Asking New Mexicans to not unnecessarily be at social gatherings, even if they're small, right? Gets us to this level. The better job we do, typically, with these kinds of public health emergencies, and the better work we do as a state, the less time we will have in the recovery phase of this emergency so that people can return to work and school. But there's not information that I have at my disposal that can give any New Mexican an absolute date by which we will see this through. Um, and I appreciate their patience about that. We're, we're going to use the science that's available to us to make the decisions. I'm going to go here and then over there. And um, then in the back. Okay. Quickly, what are we doing for the New Mexicans still stuck on the Princess cruise ship and the ones that are in quarantine? Uh, what can we tell the, to our, our tribal leaders who said they're still not going to or haven't announced cancellations of events at casinos? And then where are we at with testing? I, I, I have some more on the testing, but maybe you can address those first two all right, so let's do, let's do the, the, the uh, casinos and tribal governments. Monday, I, I have a call with every tribal leader to decide what policies will make the most sense. They are clear that, that is, those are large gatherings uh, in gaming, and it's not just tribal leaders who are engaged in gaming. We think that there is a likely opportunity to have a productive containment policy, and uh, we're working on that. So um, I appreciate that they are doing that. I don't want New Mexicans, by virtue of my answer, to think that we've not been communicating uh, with tribal leaders. But this is an issue that we realize needs more attention and is going to need very specific policies about that. Two, the uh, Diamond Princess docked in Oakland. 19 New Mexicans, and I'm going to add one who is a granddaughter, doesn't live here, but is part of that traveling group. So it's 20. It's the Grand Princess. It's the Grand Princess. Thank you, Doctor. They are all off the ship. They are in these locations um, currently. They are at Dobbins Air Force Base in Georgia. I believe there are six there, and I'll tell you why I don't know. I was literally texting with them all night, and we are uh, reassessing that that's where people are. There are six or so at Miramar, and the remainder are at Travis Air Force Base. People were in many different places to get to those Air Force bases. One, I want to thank those Air Force or, or those uh, bases and the Department of Defense for standing up their very productive infectious disease and emergency response. The communication by the Pentagon on these issues leaves a lot to be desired. Ask one of those New Mexicans. They will not shy away from telling you just how difficult it is. So if you're in contact with them, and we will not share their information with you, I know they have, if they are frustrated and tired and exasperated, it is a fair emotional response. They did not get off that boat when they were supposed to. They did not get the food and attention they were supposed to. They did not get the kind of communication from the ship that they were supposed to. And uh, I will tell you, HHS is on the ground, and they're trying. I'm not going to fault anyone. I was on the phone with HHS, I think, 1.30, 2 o'clock this morning, as people were still on the tarmac. Our plan for all those New Mexicans is to fly them home 
And if they have no symptoms, and they're getting, you know, they're, they're going through testing and, and evaluation, they'll self-isolate. We'll know about that. We'll know where that is. It will be uh, uh, managed by the Department of Health as it should be. As early as today, we might be able to get those Californians home. My goal is to get everyone home by tomorrow. We've secured the appropriate kinds of airplanes to do that. We're working with the federal government on that. It's difficult, and this is why they're so exasperated. Every state is now competing, including me, and I'm very competitive about protecting New Mexicans. And I, I don't think this is the place to show humor. This is, these are serious issues. But we really are competing for the same resources. So we've secured two planes. We feel confident that we're going to be able to get folks home. But it really is a, a, a very difficult situation for those folks. We've also addressed medical issues, prescription drug issues, caregiving issues, pet issues. Uh, we've got lost luggage. So maybe the best thing for those 20 New Mexicans, I want to thank them for their grace and patience. I want to thank them for channeling their disappointment to us in ways that allow us to do the best possible job and to help other states now navigate these problems. That's how you learn how to address now these trips and as people come home what we do. So I thank them for that. So I think we've done um, as much as we could do. Very disappointed that they were on that ship, frankly, for an, many of them, for an entire week with very little information about what was going to happen next. And just know many of them are really tired today. Um, and so, but I, I feel confident that we've done what we need to do. I'm going to get those New Mexicans home. And then lastly on testing, yep. I think in Denver they said they were too late to get tests out. They're now dealing with community transmission. Where are we at? Are we at this point where we think we're too far behind with testing, and, which is why we're doing this? I mean, where are we at with the accessibility right. of tests for people? So I, I'm going to do something that um, I'm reluctant to do, but I'm compelled. Everyone did what they're supposed to do in an emergency, which is you follow the CDC guidelines about who you're testing. I don't think that the CDC and HHS and the federal government were as clear as they should have been about how contagious this virus is and about the virility of this virus, which basically means how dangerous is it and what the death rates can be like. I think they were trying to control, this is their job, that information so that they could give us best practice. But when they did that, they delayed testing. They delayed access to the stuff that we need to do testing. So now all states, including New Mexico, are sort of caught in that dynamic. I'm working to make sure that we don't get to a place where we have to say to anyone, we were too late, right? We've been we are right now, today, we're ahead of these measures. My goal is to stay in that position. That's why on Wednesday, we said that we were standing up Tricor. Hospitals can do this testing. And I'm working on with the scientists. This is why I said I'm compelled to say this. But it's the, it's the doctors and the epidemiologists that have to make those determinations. I trust their advice and recommendation. That we, we, we would like to expand sort of that surveillance so that we know what's going on. We think that's a prudent next step. We are not prepared today to tell you exactly what that looks like, except you're seeing the results of our preparedness. You're seeing labs available. You're seeing more testing going on. You're seeing drive-ups available. You're seeing docs who are available to talk about what that looks like. And as we have a more specific strategy, except that you stand up your partners, you make sure it's available, you make sure that you're looking at your healthcare capacity, you minimize contact and spread, you provide good information, everyone washes their hands. But as we do that, that really does make a huge difference. But that's my goal. Uh, and I'm feeling confident that we're going to get to a place that is very proactive. Um, and, I, I, uh, and that's the part that I was reluctant to give because I can't tell you what that proactive measure or number looks like because it has to be based on population issues that we're addressing right now. Doctor, what did I miss? Um, last time we talked about Dr. Iralu and uh, 
Gallup and his drive-through evaluation. I want to mention there's two components to this. There's the evaluation and collection of a specimen. There's no testing that happens in a parking lot or a, a drive-through. The testing goes to the lab and is done there. But in Albuquerque now, uh, two large health systems, one has one drive-through uh, evaluation uh, station set up. Uh, another large system uh, told me during this press conference that theirs would be up uh, tomorrow. The Department of Health is actively developing uh, their own drive-through testing sites. And just remember, drive-through is, is the method of evaluation and specimen collection that promotes the curve on the right. Having people come into healthcare facilities to get their testing uh, is something we don't want to do. And so right. I'm glad I had the a chance to say that one more time. Call, there are systems uh, being brought up by multiple healthcare systems to allow you to be evaluated without having to enter a healthcare facility, and, that, and that's what we're pushing for. So where are these sites? Are they up? Who do we want using them? Um, they, many of them are up. We'll get that on our website. We'll provide that in writing to the media. We want you to provide this information. Um, two, um, you had a second part of your question. I'll make sure I get it. Was it just about how many and where are they? Yeah. Or, I'm sorry oh, about that. We use them. The yeah, and, yeah, who do you want using them? So really the issue is if you have reason to believe that you've been exposed or you're feeling any symptoms, travel. pardon me? Or travel. Yeah, travel. So if you have a reason to believe that you're exposed, and thank you, doctor, wants me to say, that's basically today travel-related, right? Or a family member travel-related, thank you. Where you're developing symptoms, this is a group that should absolutely go to Tricor, call our health number. Call our health number is really the best thing to do first. We're triaging, right? We don't want a bunch, a long line because what are we trying to do? We don't promote panic. People should not be panicked. People should be concerned and aware and should feel like we care about their challenges and then we're open to every idea to make a difference. That's, and, and so far that's occurring and I'm grateful to my state and every policymaker, every private sector business, every family member is helping us make, achieve that. It's thank you. But I, I don't want 3,000 Mexicans getting in a car and getting on our website and looking at that site. Travel related, other reason to believe that you've been exposed, call our healthcare number, developing symptoms. We are hopeful, I'm hopeful, that we can broaden that advice to more New Mexicans. That's the model. We're going to base on scientific best practices and evidence, and we'll talk about that more later. We've been doing this for two hours, so I, I, I'm reluctant also to cut this off, but the more time we have to stand up the systems that I talked about earlier so that people can access them, the better off New Mexicans are going to be. I'm going to take one more question from each side. You never got to ask your question, did you, young lady? Thank you. All right, so I'm going to do two. I'm going to, I'm going to overrule myself. Two on this side. Trip, you might have to help me. Two on that side. Um, young lady, I apologize that I kept forgetting about no, you. No, that's fine. Um, so another question from our Spanish-speaking audience, uh, especially the families that live on the border, they're worried about the border being closed or just traveling, uh, especially for those that have um, families in Mexico or Central America. There are 12 cases that I'm aware of uh, in Mexico. There is nothing to indicate that this virus, which is an important issue for us to address is a border-related issue. It is, in fact, a human contact and global issue, so we have to care about it. I just don't want people to think that the border is a specific additional risk more than traveling to New York City. Same risk, right? Is that clear to everyone? Same risk. There are some folks around the country and some New Mexicans that think that the virus has originated in Mexico and at the border and in South and Central America. That's not true. There are some New Mexicans and some Americans that think that there's a higher rate of spread and less public health in countries like Mexico. That is also false. But every travel contact creates risk. So we want to minimize that. The border is not closed. The public health operations that have been at the border will continue to be at the border, be expanded as appropriate. We are about minimizing risk. I'm going to need help for folks to minimize risk. So the same rules apply there. 
as apply statewide, and we are keeping a very close eye on it. So one more. Um, okay. All right, I'm sorry. Well, I'll make sure that... Guys, if we don't get to everyone, I, we will get you. Okay. Um, mine's a number question. I know we had, talk, uh, we had been told that there were 24, that was our uh, capacity to test 2,400. I was wondering how many of those tests have been used since then? Um, and I know there's a meeting happening today, but with Tricor, how many more would be available? Or? So, yeah, our goal is to make sure that we don't ever have to answer this. We, uh, we uh, don't have any more uh, testing ability. Now, my job is to make sure that that never happens. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going to have someone who's managing all as much information. With Tricor now up, our up-to-date information is a little slower, right, because it's not something we're in direct control of. They have to communicate with us, and they are. I don't want to make it sound like our partners are not productive. They are productive. But that's just another added layer. So I'm going to see if the Department of Health can answer that question. And we'll continue to kind of put that information out in a productive way that, again, make sure that people know we're prepared, but don't create alarm by any New Mexican. Secretary Thank Kunkel. You. Thank you, Governor. The reason we can't say specifically how many are left is because we are testing constantly. So I don't want to give you a number that changes in an hour from now. Tricor was ready with 5,000 yesterday and they were expecting to be able to double their capacity. We are talking to them right now and I can put that out on our website later. Thank you. And this is the, the information I was giving out Wednesday, right? We're not waiting. Waiting for the federal government to allocate, waiting for someone to figure it out means I can't do this. So uh, that's an indication. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, I think it was your response to Morgan. Um, if, if there is, a, does start to be a community spread, what specific measures would the state take? It, it, it's going to depend. Where is the spread? A population is affected. Um, but we will continue to do increased social isolation. Uh, increase services to people so that people aren't exposing out. Uh, we need to make sure that that occurs. Uh, and uh, it's, it's too early to talk about that. But we have, the good news is, we have broad power to address it. Good news is, we aren't going to use that broad power to further interrupt the day-to-day -day lives of New Mexicans without looking at where we are on this curve. So this is my guiding line. And as we get more information about tests, so expect that. And we got a, a, a you know, people are, yesterday schools weren't closed, today they are. This from it changes. It's a rapidly moving um, effort we assess every day. So it's premature to tell you exactly what we'd have to see to do this. But I'm in contact with the people I expect to be looking at this evidence to give me scientific evidence, to show me what's the best effort. That means businesses, some businesses might have to restrict or close. We will look at every issue. You should expect on this website, and I don't want to open up more questions, but for example, you know, we're going to have a protocol at the airport, right? Information is power. That power saves lives. Knowing where people come from, knowing if they have issues, knowing what we can do about it. So you should expect to see a lot of New Mexico public health presence in your communities. That should not scare anyone. That should tell people that we know that if we're present at places where there are risks, we are mitigating risk and protecting New Mexicans. So it's going to depend on the next several days. Can you say what the airport protocol yeah, so we're getting out information. We're going to stand up some public health operations. We want to get a sense about if people are experiencing some symptoms or have questions, we have a place to direct them. And we'll put out the very specifics about the airport protocol on this website. But I want folks to know there's not a business and there's not an issue that we are not talking about and preparing for and standing up a plan for. And we're doing it in real time. Um, all right, one more here, and then we're going to close it, but we're, we'll be available. Okay. About an hour ago, you talked about um, the, the no out-of-pocket costs, and I know that the superintendent insurance put out a, a release this morning saying there will be none. Can you just make a statement about that? Right. I mean, because it's there's actually two parts. The part that the insurance superintendent has control over, and they that board and that uh, superintendent, right? That's again, this is why you declare an emergency. You don't do it to panic your population. You do it so that the extraordinary measures and powers that your government officials have 
can be utilized to protect your families. So that protection is it directs insurers and it directs hospitals, right, that no patient should have a copay or out-of-pocket deductible cost related to what we're doing to minimize the spread of this disease and to deal with testing. In addition, which is also premature until I have all the pieces together, but I want New Mexicans to know we're thinking ahead. We have New Mexicans who were uninsured. So there are vehicles for us to make sure that we can uh, open up enrollment periods, find ways to help subsidize premiums, make sure that we get people. We want people, right, if people are afraid to be tested or treated, if they're worried about bills, then that minimizes my ability to do containment. So we're gonna use every tool in New Mexico's toolbox to ease the burden, ease the pain, and to make everyone feel like they're being protected to the highest degree possible. I wanna thank everyone for being here today. I want New Mexicans again to know that we are just being prepared and safe and productive and proactive. And I appreciate that people are not panicked and I appreciate that folks are giving us information about how we can continue to expand our efforts. And remember our website and the new numbers, I'm gonna give them all to you again. The health hotline is ready, has been ready. 855-600-3453. If you have traveled, if you've been with someone who has recently traveled, if you have symptoms or health-related questions, please call this number. If you've got other questions about schools and childcare and food security and work and unemployment benefits and anything else, I want you to call this number that's in process, but very soon, and when I mean very soon, I'm directing people to just get it done, but we're not quite ready, right? We're training people, getting the information, making sure the rollovers work. That number, 833-551-0513. We are uploading every link and every piece of information that we've discussed today on our website, newmexico.gov. That's been in process for the last couple of hours. We will keep doing that. I don't want New Mexicans to feel like when they go to it, it's not quite right. It will be right. But we're doing that. This, that work is happening all day today. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your attention and your time today.